Imagine there was a world, an alternate universe, where Mac OS Classic, you know, Mac OS 8, Mac OS 9, that sort of platinum look, was also in a world which coexisted with Mac OS 10 or Mac OS X, as some people call it. Imagine if that was actually a reality, and it happened, and it was called Rhapsody. I'm not talking about a skin here for Mac OS X. No, I'm talking about the two becoming one. Stay tuned, I'll show you how this thing works and how to get it installed on your own virtual machine. Hello and welcome to Al's Geek Lab. How are you doing? I hope you're well. Now, do you remember a time many, many years ago when we had Mac OS 9, Mac OS 8, and then before then it was just kind of called System. Um, so this is way before what became Mac OS 10 or Mac OS X, um, and now they just call it Mac OS, right? Way before all of that, there was the standard Mac OS, and I think 9.2 was the last one. Kind of looked like this. Here's a little uh, YouTube uh, clip of Mac OS 9.2 from Noble Tech, and you can see this is what it like. Now, I don't know about you, but when I played with Mac OS, it had these classic Mac OS. I'm gonna call these anything before Mac OS X or Mac OS 10, whatever you wanted to call it at the time. Anything before that Mac OS 10 time was classic Mac OS. Um, now, one thing about Mac OS before then is it was a completely different operating system. It worked entirely different. It wasn't just a little bit different. It was a completely different kernel. It wasn't Unix-like in nature. Um, the Mac OS X kernel basically was a Unix kernel, which was called Mac. And it was worked on by Steve Jobs and uh, all of the engineers over at Next. They made an operating system called Next Step to go with their Next Cube and so forth. All of those particular types of operating systems and uh, product lines, okay? So you had this Unix-like operating system and basically Apple had tried for a very, very long time to make their own multitasking, fully preemptive multitasking, multi-user operating system. And it didn't really come to be. In fact, Microsoft were sort of winning the race at this time. Apple were this down and out company. I mean, I'm not getting on Apple here, so don't hate me in the comments. But my Apple weren't really doing so well. They were they were kind of languishing. Their operating system wasn't working. This was the mid '90s, right? Things were a lot different. And you know, Microsoft had come out with Windows 95 by then. I think Windows NT was either out or just about to be out. And that was a fully multi-user, multi-threaded operating system that did all sorts of things that pretty much classic Mac OS couldn't do. But the one thing about classic Mac OS that I loved was the way it looked. It was a nice looking operating system. It didn't do an awful lot of the things that we kind of take for granted today in an operating system. But one thing is, I kind of love these kind of little cutesy graphics, uh, the fonts even, um, just the way that it kind of all looked and it felt. And then what happened is, Apple needed a bit of injection of uh, something to make an, an operating system that worked the way that they needed to do. Now, they could either reinvent OS 9 and turn it into a new operating system which had all the things they needed, the multitasking, etc, 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 but they would also have to pretty much throw away the entire code base and start from scratch. So they could make it look like the old Mac OS, but not anything else. It pretty much had to be done from scratch. And they knew this. They had tried that pretty much in a version of Mac OS 8, which never really saw public light of day. So what they did is they actually thought, well, rather than build it ourselves again, we'll go out to the market. That is exactly what they did. In fact, they looked at another few products. They looked at one called BIOS, which eventually they didn't end up purchasing because they purchased one from a guy called Mr. Stephen Jobs. The rest is history. It was Next Step, of course. And Next Step turned into a thing called Rhapsody. Now, you might not have heard of Rhapsody. You certainly heard of 
OS X, and that's because OS X is the operating system that we all use on our Macs to this very day. In fact, there has been much change under the hood from the original Next Step Core onto Rhapsody, onto OS X, and then today, what we call MacOS, very, very different again. It's changed quite substantially since those sort of early noughties, late nineties kind of days. But this is what happened in the interim period between macOS 9 point something and macOS 10 or X. There was a developer release which uh, Apple engineers could allow beta testing and uh, user acceptance testing on the market. And it was called Rhapsody. So it was a code name. And this is a video here from Frederick Anderson of what they called Rhapsody. Now, bear in mind that kind of up until this point in time, on the Macintosh, the Macintosh was pretty much a power PC um, architecture. So it used the PPC IBM CPU chips. It did not use the Intel chips. But over on the um, next step kind of things, they were making a product, the operating system itself, to work on a, a multitude of chips, and some of them were the x86, or as you and I know it, the Intel platform. And if you have a look here, this video, you can see that this looks a little bit similar to Finder in the modern Mac OS, well, at least the, the early builds of Mac OS, the, Jagu the Jaguars and the Tigers and stuff like that, they're very early ones, but it does look pretty similar. There are a lot of similarities in terms of the way that the Finder there looks. You can see there that that doesn't look like the classic Finder of Mac OS 9. It looks more like the one that's stuck in the Mac OS 10 or Mac OS X. So what's this all about? Well, what you're seeing here is the developer release of Mac OS 10 or Mac OS X. But you can see here that the skin upon it looks pretty familiar. It looks more like Mac OS 9 than it does for Mac OS X. So there was at some point in Apple's belief or Apple, Apple's lifetime that they thought that the next evolution of Mac OS was just going to kind of carry on that kind of look and feel of the previous Mac OS systems. And at, at some point, they decided to radically change it and go with the um, Apple um, Mac OS X look, which is yeah completely different entirely. So what I'm going to look at today is Apple Rhapsody. And the interesting thing is they didn't just release it for the um, IBM PowerPC CPU range, which they had done for all the systems up until that point. They actually released it. And as you can see from here, from the manual, for PC compatible computers. They also released it alongside that for the PPC, but also for IBM X86 32-bit platforms. And you can see this date on this, uh, maybe you can see it if I zoom in, 1997. So this was just after the acquisition of Next Step. What it hadn't been done for long, they pulled Next Step apart and put this straight into development work in Apple. So that's the timeline we're going through here. So I've downloaded this um, this this version of Rhapsody, and I've downloaded it from uh, this website here. But if you go on Google yourself, you can find this very easily. Um, and you can see here Rhapsody. Um, there was a developer preview. Then there was Server 1.0, and then there was 1.0 of what became OS 10. You can see there quite clearly that is the Aqua theme. It was called of um, Mac OS X, and this is much more like the classic look, which was um, called Platinum, I do believe. So you can see how the applications, you know, they've got mailviewer.app and textedit.app. These are applications that you are probably familiar with even now, today, in modern versions of macOS. But you can see here that they were running in uh, icons that perhaps kind of looked half like Next Step, or maybe not even half that, maybe a quarter like Next Step, maybe a quarter like modern OS X, and a quarter like um, something else, and then a quarter maybe the, um, the the platinum version of Mac OS. So a real mishmash of different technologies there going on, and it's incredibly 
interesting to see what these things look like. I think that it would be great in this video to get it working on a normal x86 PC. So I'll just, I'll just show you those again. What it looked like, this was in 1997. You can see that they look very much like the, um, the, the, the Mac OS of old, the Mac OS 9 Platinum look, and then straight into developer preview, and you can see that this was on a power PC, and it looked very much like the new, the new Mac OS 10 look, and you can see that the X is put in place. And then you went straight into 10.0, and that's Mac OS 10, the one that we kind of know and kind of followed along the development with uh, from then on. So everything, everything we want to do is we want to look at Rhapsody today. So there are a few developer releases that were available over the time. You can see that they were available at both PPC and x86. Uh, we're going to look at the developer release too, because that was the very last one that was available for x86. After that, it was just PPC. And if you remember, at the beginning of the life of Mac OS X, there was no uh, x86 builds. It was only on G3, G4 CPUs. Then after that, it was at that point where Apple went to x86, went Intel for a very, very long time and have only recently changed over to their A1 and A2 type CPUs. So um, without further ado, let's see. We, what I've done is I've downloaded all these files already and I have downloaded uh, a tool called x86 box. I've downloaded the desk image here from this website. Um, you can find your own, of course, Apple Rhapsody, which has this install manual. It has a CD and it has a boot floppy as well as a driver disk. I'll come back to that in a moment. And I'm going to do this uh, pretty much live. I'm not going to, um, I'm going to make mistakes, I'm sure. But uh, so I've got this, I've got that. I've got the instructions. I've got, uh, this here, this is what, what you need. So you need x86 box, the website I'll post in the descriptions here. So this is x86 box 3.11. You can use other <clears throat> virtualization tools such as VMware Player and so forth. But um, I've, from what I've read, this one actually works the best. So download this one. And you can, if you scroll right to the bottom of the page of the rate, latest release, you can find out where to download it. It's actually these ones here. You can see the app image ones for Linux, and then there's uh, Mac OS releases, and then there's a Windows release here. So that's where to get an x86 box, right down at the bottom of that page. That took me a little while to find myself. And you can also get a tool called x86 box manager, um, which just helps um, with managing your particular VMs. I don't think we're gonna need that one and there is a ROM set as well that you do require. So if you go through in the x86, um, x86 box downloads, you'll see that there's also an, a ROMs folder in there. You do require to download that ROMs folder um, and you can download it in tar GZ format or zip. So if you're running on Windows, you probably want the zip one. Once you've got that, I've got this folder kind of organized as such. So the one that's important obviously is x86 box Windows 64. And in there you can see all the files that it's downloaded, but there's also a folder which I've called ROM. So I created that folder. I actually went in and you know made a new folder because I unzipped this ROMs, which is this from the source code there. Um, so that'll give you ROMs-v3.11.zip. And I extracted that and it gave me a folder. If I just do this again for you. 311, and you'll see what you get. You get ROMs 311. And then inside that, you get another folder called ROMs 311. And there are all your ROMs and so forth. So all I did is I renamed that folder there to just be ROMs and then moved it inside the Windows uh, x86 box folder. And that's what I got there. So ROMs just like that. That's what I've got. So now I can double click on this and run the x86 box. It's very important to make sure that that ROMs folder is in there. Otherwise, um, it will not work. You have to do it that way. So if you're getting any problem and it says something about ROMs at the beginning, that's probably why. All right, now, so I have the 
the image, which I've downloaded from a website. I have the ROMs all set up and I have x86 box downloaded and it's not really something that you need to install, but there you go. All right, so let's get to the installation process. First of all, I'm going to need to have to configure the machine itself, the x86 box itself. So to do that, what I do is I double click on this and I bring up the x86 box and then I think if I go into settings under tools, I can configure the VM itself. Now, first of all, let's have a look at what types of VMs you can get. By default, it's gonna sit on this one, the 8088, which is the original, or 8088, is the original IBM PC. What we wanna probably do is go for something like a Socket 7, which is basically a Pentium class PC and you can change these you can you know go all the different types here and I would probably go with a Pentium MMX because it was the you know the highest quality CPU at that sort of era so when we think about the era of when this came out and we look at the installation manual you can see a 4, 486 a Pentium or a Pentium Pro so you can you can change these sort of things but I'll go with a Pentium MMX that should be should be good. Um, you can choose. You could probably get away with going up to a socket, a socket 370, or even a slot two, sort of like a Pentium Pro, Pentium Two kind of range, that sort of thing. Then you can choose the amount of memory you want to have. The um, instructions suggest here at least 32 megs of RAM. 48 is recommended. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to, and I hope this works. I'll go for 64 megs of RAM and uh, let's have a look. Uh, it says a display adapter which is supported, so let's have a look, see. Um, we obviously don't want to have a um, CGA, which is a four color display adapter, so let's move that up to something which is definitely a VGA display, or better. Let's see, so if, um, if I go for this, uh, maybe this Diamond Stealth, uh, maybe the 2000, something like that. So it's not a, it's not a 3D card. I don't think it's just a, it's two verge maybe. I'm gonna go for that one. Hopefully that works fine. We'll have a standard mouse. Obviously we want to have a mouse here, so we'll go standard PS2 mouse. Uh, let's have some sound. So we'll have a sound blaster type card. So let's just keep it simple and go for a. Sound Blaster 16, see, it's the standard ISA card, one of those. Um, let's have a network card, let's see if we can do that. don't know if this will work very good, but um, let's go for a, let's go for, let's just go for the 3C501, not the best card in the world. We can always come back to that later, but let's put it in for now. I don't think I'm going to need a printer, so I'm going to leave that as is. Now, I'm going to create a hard drive, and I'll use an IDE controller. I will use a floppy drive controller. Um, don't really know what the difference is between these ones here, but um, maybe I'll just go with this one. don't think there's much to do with these. Let's not choose any uh, SCSI. Um, let's make a new hard drive, so, and we'll call this Rhapsody DR2, and let's see, we'll have a big enough hard drive, let's see, um, let's call this, let's put this, let's, this is the disk image file, so it's basically the hard drive in a file itself on your normal hard drive, and we'll call this um, Rhapsody DR2. Up there okay and then this this is um this is quite an interesting tidbit here but this is the chs values what they were called back in the day chs stands for cylinders heads and sectors and basically when you multiply those values together it gives you the, the specific size of the disc this is old school technology at its best so let's do um let's do 63 heads uh, 63 cylinders sorry Let's do 16 heads and let's go 2, 4, 4, 8. Uh, sorry, not sectors. We want um, cylinders. We want cylinders to be 2, 4, 4, 8. We want 16 heads and 63 sectors, giving us a 1.2 gigabyte 
uh, disc, looks like it. I think that's it. Um, and it's a custom one. Now you can choose from these old type, which are predefined types of hard drives. They were called just hard drive types and they went up to 518 megabytes. This one gives it a bit more space, basically um, our, uh, our 1.2 gig hard drive. We're using it on the hard, the bus that we just created in the last step and uh, we'll go with um, maximum speed. Okay, so there it's, um, there it's created that disk image and if you have a look down here, uh, that's that's created it right there. See this? Yeah. So hopefully that has been done correctly. I'm hopeful, very hopeful. And let's go here. Like the type of floppy disks, uh, we want a we want to get rid of those. We want a three and a half inch, and we want a 1.4 megabyte. Uh, do we need a CD-ROM? Yes, we should probably have a CD-ROM. Oh, here we go. Let's go to Tappy. Ah, there we go. Uh, we'll have. Yeah, I don't think it really matters. We could do, let's, let's just keep it for compatibility at eight speed, um, just in case, but that's the CD-ROM drive. Eight speed, and that looks fine. Other removable disks, no other peripherals. I don't think we need anything specific in here. Let's go OK, save those settings. Now, you can see that the new machine has now booted up and we've got 65 meg of RAM and we're getting the defaults error, which is fine. So let's up, have a look up here. It says press F8 and F12 on middle mouse button to release the mouse. So it's captured my mouse. I can't do anything at the moment. So I'm going to press F8 and F12. See, then we get a mouse back. I'm going to add the media. So if we go to existing image to attach that floppy disk image and we go to uh, x86 box and this is the folder which I downloaded the Rhapsody images to which I downloaded earlier we'll see boot floppy and there we go we've got an installation floppy and a driver disk so let's just hope that that's enough and then let's go with um, the CD-ROM and insert the CD-ROM itself as well so CD-ROM image again let's go back into the apps Apple Rhapsody folder and then you can see the CD image is there. Okay, looks good. Okay, and you can see that the hard drive has been detected there as well as the CD-ROM drive. So the, at the moment, the system's just hung there just saying CMOS check some error. The reason for that is because this machine is never loaded and so we've not actually gone into the CMOS settings. I think that that's okay. We shouldn't need to worry about that, but uh, you never know. Let's hope for the best. So let's now just try and press F1 and continue with the install. Okay. Rhapsody boot one, here we go. So Rhapsody will start up in 10 seconds or you can type dash V. Um, I'm assuming it's just going to load up and do this. Okay. Um, you can use uh, one for the English language and USA keyboard and all the other languages. So we'll just go with one. And it's just saying there, this program is not for installing Rhapsody on a hard drive. This is not an upgrade. Existing files will be deleted. Now, obviously that's not to worry because we are in a VM here. It's just going to format that particular virtual disk image that we created a moment ago. So let's prepare the system for installation of Rhapsody. Okay, now I've got to install the Rhapsody device drivers disk in the floppy disk, uh, the floppy disk drive. So let's change out that uh, floppy disk. Go up here to media existing image again so let's just eject that first one actually let's do that then go media and then go existing image boot floppy and then we can see the driver disk is there let's choose that and then press all right now we have a floppy disk in the drive contains device drivers for the following scuzzy adapters now we didn't configure any scuzzy so hopefully we don't need to do this, but um, we did because we did an Atapi based um, CD drive. So I'm just hitting seven here and again, seven. And this one here, PC Tech RZ 1000 IDE Atapi might be the one or the Intel one or the plug and play. <laughs> There's a few to choose from, but basically um, we want to use a 
EIDE and a Tappy. Type one. So it's plug and play. Um, or those. So it's probably more likely to be three or six. Um, I'm going to go with the number three one and hope that it works. I'm going to say I don't need any more uh, additional device drivers. So let's press one now. There's it all booting up. Preposterous time in real time clock. <laughs> All right, so we're into the graphical user interface part. It's not very graphical, I'll give you that. And uh, what's interesting at the top here is you can see Rhapsody release Apple 5.1 Mac for Intel. So basically, uh, there's two things about that. One, Mac is the name of the kernel which was involved in the Unix space of the, um, the original next step operating system. And, it, and Mac OS, even to this very day, still retains the name Mac for the kernel, the Unix kernel inside Mac OS 10 or Mac OS that it's called now. And you can see here, this is an Intel release, which is also quite interesting because, you know, very shortly after this, they dropped the Intel releases and they focused entirely on building for PPC. So, okay, I'm ready to install Rhapsody. I'll press, I'll press one here. Let's see what we do. Uh, so the drive it's detected is 1.2 gig. Uh, let's install Rhapsody on this disk. Gives us the option here of uh, pressing 1 to erase the entire disk and use everything for Rhapsody. Set aside from some space for DOS, which is really interesting. So they also acknowledge that this is going on to a potentially Microsoft computer, or Microsoft operating system computer, or uh, three advanced options. I'm just going to go with 1 because we just only want to use this for Rhapsody. To start installing Rhapsody, press 1. It goes. So after about, what, I don't know, 10 minutes, um, the process has finished. It tells you the install has done, remove the floppy disk. So to do that, I'll just go to media, go to the floppy drive one and go eject. And hopefully that's all I need to do. I could probably get rid of the CD-ROM as well, but it doesn't tell me to do that. So I'll, I'll leave it, press return, see what happens. Energy Star BIOS, okay. Rhapsody is gonna start in 10 seconds. Oh, ho, ho, look at that. A very bare bones looking desktop there. Wow, right. Okay, now we're in some sort of business, I would like to say. The mouse is actually working. So if I go to this, oh, here we go. Right, Diamond Stealth 3D, I think is what we want. Let's, let's go with that, yep. Yeah. All right, so the display, the PS2 was fine for the mouse, I think, so we'll leave that. Um, and I think we chose the 3C501, that one there. So let's just double check that, if we can see better that. What did we say? Uh, the network, network, 3C501 or 3C500, just see, 3C. Let's go ISA adapter, and memory address is 300, RQ level three, and I think that's it. It does say um, DMA3 as well, but it's not giving a chance to say anything on that one. So we're just going to leave that at none for now and hope that that works out. SCSI, I don't think we need to worry about. Sound card, we configured a Sound Blaster 16. So let's go for this one here. And again, let's just check how we had that configured. Um, this has chosen DMA1 and 5 at a port address of 220. Usually port address 220 is correct. Let's just double check. So settings, found ISA at 220, 330, 5 and 1. 5 and 1 is chosen and 220. So we should be okay there. And then we need anything else here. I think these are just all the other things that it's already chosen or has configured looks like it. Okay, so now that kind of looks like the system that we have configured. Let's go for gold and press save. And it looks like we're gonna to have to install a whole heck ton more software. 
and it's really interesting. I've just noticed a few names of the device drivers and software that's going to install, obviously, wraps the essentials. But then if we go down here, Sybase Adapter. Uh, so some sort of database software, really interesting. But then um, Japanese, don't know why it wants to install Japanese. The Emacs text ed ed editor, which is a uh, GNU product that was in you know, BSD and all of the, the earlier Unixes, is obviously still available, very much in use today. Samba, which is the, um, or SMB, the Microsoft type, file server and print server. So that's again, very interesting that it, uh, it was bundled with Rhapsody. I don't know whether they just removed Samba and made their own implementation of, Rap um, of Samba within Mac OS, or whether it was always just Samba and they just bundled it. Printer uses the Unix PPD service and uh, there's some software libraries and so forth that, with that. So I'm gonna need a crap ton more disk space to be used. I don't know if I under provisioned the disk. Maybe I should have given it a bigger drive, but off it goes. It's copying files now. Installing the bash shell as obviously many other things going there. I'll let it do its thing. All right, well, it looks like the installation has successfully been completed. So uh, click this restart button and see what the uh, see where the go is. This really takes me back. This whole um, screen here just <laughs> really takes me back to the day of uh, having my first sort of Pentium class PC. Good memories there, playing Duke Nukem and um, maybe uh, Doom and stuff like that. Anyway completely different thing we're talking about today. Um, so this is this is basically the, you know, when you'd have the original Apple logo come up and then the little progress bar down the bottom, that's what it, that would be. But obviously this coming up saying Rhapsody. And here we have a little bit of color, this sort of purple color. Looking good so far. My mouse cursor moves very quickly. Whoa, here we go, look at this. Rhapsody Setup Assistant. Based on your answers to a few questions, kind of sounds personal. This assistant makes some basic settings on your computer and lets you access the internet. All right, interesting. Uh, USA is my keyboard layout. I have a local area network. Um, so this is really advanced if you think about it. Um, you know, Microsoft Windows 3.1 and even 95. So this is 97, I guess. Uh, the 95, Windows 95 did not ship with TCP IP networking configured by default, right? So uh, this is obviously doing that and it's uh, saying, well, are you using a network connection or a LAN uh, or a modem? So um, pretty, pretty advanced sort of stuff, I guess. To, I mean, it was Unix, so I mean, it should be, but you know, it was, it's nice to see that in this sort of setup. Um, DHCP, obviously, get an IP address manually or automatically. Um, so let's do DHCP. Uh, it's not DHCP, it's boot P. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I don't think that's working, yeah. So, well, of course, we're not going to get boot P. So it doesn't use DHCP. That's very interesting. I would have thought that DHCP would have worked at that particular point in time. So Your computer is connected to a NetInfo network. So this must be the sharing uh, on um, Samba, maybe? This is... Do you want to use your computer's NetInfo? Sure, why not? I'll put Google in there and hope for the best. I don't think this is going to work. Right, I'm not US Pacific. I'm over here in Nozoland. So I'll click that one. I like it. It's very, it's very similar, actually, to you know modern Linux, say, Ubuntu-type configuration, this part. Do I want to use NTP? I'm going to say no because I don't think the networking is going to work. Um, what day is it? Oh, May 1998. How sweet. No, nope, let's just say it's a lot later than that. How the years have passed me by. <laughs> and it's November the 30th today. And it's 18.32 uh, p.m. User accounts. Create a user account. Yep, let's do that. Uh, Al's Geek Lab. There we go. I've put an invalid login name in. Oh dear. That's a really strong password time. Can you guess what it is? Automatically. Administrator password. Oh, there's um, administrator password as well. 
Let's see, okay. Ready to make basic settings in your computer systems hardware. Go for it, why not? Now we want to restart the machine again. Here we go. Moment of truth, moment of truth. Don't know why every single time it checks the disk, but it doesn't seem to take very long. Very much like a just a normal Unix server starting up. But the interesting thing is that we're just about to see as well is that it looks very much like Mac OS 8 or 9, you know? Have a look. You can see the widgets here, the binder especially, looks very much like the Mac OS 9 one. And you can see the funny sort of minimize. I never did like the minimize. I've got to say, I never, never liked that kind of minimize. It minimized it to a bar. Um, and then this kind of full screened or restored. So that, that behavior, the window man management behavior, identical to the Mac OS 9 look and feel about Workspace Manager. Oh wow, 64 mega RAM with a Pentium processor, 1.2 gig hard drive, and then you can see Workspace Manager, which was probably later on called re recalled Finder, release 5.1, Apple computer, 1988 to 1998. I don't really know what those years signify, whether those are the years of next step, 1988 would sort of align more with um, with Next Step rather than the Mac OS Finder. Interesting. And this here is obviously the the um, Finder itself. It's a bit more looks much more like the original Finder inside Mac OS 10 as opposed to classic Mac. You can see there it's going through the levels of first of all the, the main root of the disk in the users mailboxes. And then a file in there called active.inbox. If I go into open, oh, there we go. There's my mail configure application. So it knows that it's got a file handler. So I'm just going to quit out of that for a moment and see if we can um, look at right at the root of the disk. Yep, here we are. So this is the root of the disk. There's the Rhapsody install folder. And click on that. Double clicks, it just gives me another window system administration. Build disk, configure, net admin, and all that sort of stuff. Applications. Let's have a look at the clock application. Starting clock. And that's just like the one in Mac OS 9 up there on that taskbar. I don't think that clock made it into the final uh, Mac OS 10 clock. Preferences. Preferences. Appearance. It's a bit clunky. Kind of looked like, you know. You run this preferences application and that fires off an yet another preferences sub application, separate application, all of its own. But uh, there's the current theme. And then if we go, oh yeah, look, there's Platinum. So Platinum was the name of the Mac OS 9 uh, type display. So let's go uh, Sakura, oh, Sakura like, you know, this purplish color. What about Apple Blue? Apple Dark Platinum. Okay. All right, it's given it a slightly darker appearance. Desktop, font, all of these very much were straight out of Mac OS 9. Loving it, loving it. I love the look of these. Absolutely love the look back in the day. Come out of that. Date and time, expert, expert, what's expert? Ah, oh, see, so this is much more of a Unixy sort of thing. You can see here, read, write, and execute is, is 100% uh, a Unix type permission ses setting. Um, oh, there, if we go into expert mode, you can uh, notice all the hidden files have started to come up there. Dot profile, for example. Right clicking on this does absolutely nothing, by the way. There's no notion of right click in this uh, version of the OS. You can set uh, this to the keyboard, localization, all the things that we've kind of done already. Login items, the monitor. The mouse, let's try and see if I can slow down the mouse a bit because it's very fast. That's very slow. <laughs> That's quite fast. And let's see if we can get a... Any of these working? I think so. Uh, what, have, what else have we got? We've got Mail Viewer, Print Manager, Terminal. That's one you definitely didn't get in OS 9. And it's using the shell. Yep, I wonder if you can launch bash. There you go, you can launch bash and you can go and do whatever you want to do. 
I can become. Well, I can't become. I don't think pseudo would be there. No, that's too old for that. But uh, yeah, you can you can see all the the binaries there and all the rest. So very interesting. Fully multi-user operating system. All the nice parts of both the the, the Mac OS Classic and the um, what became Mac OS 10 in one thing that looks like Mac OS class. Very, very interesting. I don't know what, what Java browser is. Uh, that's a web browser or, no, I think it's more like some sort of, yeah, Java based. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> wow. This must be for developers. I would like to say I know what that's all about, but I, I don't quite know, but these are Java classes nonetheless. Remember, this was all built on the sort of Coco type solution um, and it's all object oriented. So this was really kind of cutting type technology at the time, really brand new kind of way of thinking about things when uh, Next Step came out. Um, project Builder. So I guess this would have been the, what became the, the way to write applications using the tool, the compiler and debugger. Yes, the object of C was mentioned already. That was what you were building your tools in. You were building them all in uh, Objective-C. This is really brand new stuff. At the time this was kick ass, really was. So uh, uh, whether you noticed it or not, in Mac OS, even today, all the binaries, which are applications, all end in .app. They're usually hidden, that .app thing, that's hidden, but uh, it still ends in .app. Text edit, now everybody remembers text edit because it's still in Mac OS 10 all these years later, Mac OS about, about text edit. Yep. I wonder if these are the same names that you see in um, in uh, the system on Mac OS now. These people's names. Somebody want to go off check Mac uh, Mac OS the current Mac OS text edit and see if these names are still in there. You can see at the bottom here Java conversion by Eve Arau and uh, Andrew Platzer. Very interesting that they were making a good big point about converting their uh, applications to Java. Java was seen as the next big thing at the time. And uh, you know, it was for a while, it really was. There's text edit, the thing that we all know and love. And what else have we got? Show processes, let's have a look at that. A very simple process monitor there showing which applications are running and you could force quit them. So basically kill the application. Uh, so let's kill text edit, that to die and it dies quite quite happily. Well, look at that you can you can drag a menu off the task I don't know how I did that what I did but yeah it looks like you can drag a menu straight off the task menu at the top look at that that's a really weird really weird interesting little tidbit so if I click on this it brings up there and it comes back so a separate menu the help menu which is from the top down here but you can also let it just tear off and put it wherever you want on the screen. You can leave it down here and say, oh, I want to get my help at any point in time. Well, I just go click there and up comes help. That obviously didn't make it into Mac OS. So there you go. That's kind of like the history of what Apple did and how it almost kind of stayed as the classic Mac OS. And I, for one, I would have loved this because I really did love the classic Mac OS look. It was somebody's decision. I don't know whose decision it was at Apple to change from the classic look that you see before you into something which resembled Mac OS uh, 10, which is what it became. So it didn't take a long time because in a few months of development, that, that uh, eventually changed. We can see that Rhapsody was released in, I think it was 1998. And then we go straight to um, developer preview. So this was, so that was 1998. And this is the final developer preview, I think. And we can see that that was 1999 on the side here. So really they, two, they made two major decisions at that point in time. One, to kill off the Intel platform for whatever reason. I, again, I don't know enough about what happened, what the executive decisions were in the platform at that time in the Mac OS team and also they chose to give it this sort of 
this look, right? The aqua look, as it was called eventually, changing it from that on the left there to this on the right. Very interesting. And this was, you know, obviously before release, before its final release. And then we went into, you know, uh, what became the, the, the final release in, I think, 2000, 2001. That's kind of what it looked like. Some of it, very similar. You can see the finder here, definitely looks very similar, but it had a dock. That was a, you know, different difference. And, you know, you either loved or hate the dock. And nah, I, 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 I didn't hate the dock, but I also didn't mind this as well. And I'd, I'd gotten quite used to that in, in classic Mac OS. It didn't really bother me one way or the other. I think the inclusion of icons beside these, which probably would have made it in if it had stayed with this look, uh, would have made all the difference here but you know i guess maybe they were just tired and ready for a change um interesting to see but uh definitely there's oh there's preview as well you, you may probably still know preview pretty well preview made it into um this version of the release so that's a very quick look at uh, both the initial developer release or developer release 2 i should say of mac os 10 or what became mac os 10 and also how to install it using x86 box uh, on this one this time on windows but you can also use x86 box on mac uh, pc and i think even linux so have a shot yourself uh, see what you can do with it let me know what you do with it in the comments below i'd really like to hear from you and if you know anybody at the apple team or if you know any stories or secrets beyond um, why they changed to the the you know the aqua theme why they got rid of certain functions that i've talked about i'd love to hear from you in the comments if you've enjoyed this episode of uh, on Al's Geek lab you know hit me up in press that subscribe button like the video and also set the alert bell to notify you of any new videos coming out otherwise not much point in subscribing i guess but if you do that it would it would be great i'd love you to see more of the videos that we've got we've got lots of videos coming up like this along the channel in the future. Stay tuned. Thanks for now.